process of doing so made those possible responses the grounds for my judgment. Thus, the judgment of taste should be understood less as an imposition and more as a speech act designed to elicit responses from others. The whole point of analyzing taste is to convince readers that there are no concepts or standards by which to judge works of art and literature as rationalist aestheticians once believed. As Kant goes out of his way to indicate, the judgment, this is beautiful, lays claim to a conditioned necessity, that is, a necessity in search of confirmation. It is thus of great importance whether or not the judgment is actually articulated, for its expression is what invites others to weigh in. Far from qualifying any one person's right to judge a given presentation, the critique of taste shows that if we call something beautiful, then we must expect that everyone else is in possession of the same capacity, even if they don't always judge with taste. For Kant, the problem is not to demonstrate that judgments of taste exist. It is to become clear about the role that communicability, and thus others, play in the constitution of our pleasure. With Kant, then, we are able to develop a philosophical explanation as to why the narrator of Proust's A la Recherche would insist that there's a distinctive form of pleasure derived from experiencing art with another. This social aspect of the beautiful is much more than the list of supposed benefits typically advanced in, def in defense of art. For example, the ancient idea that art instructs a people in a common way of feeling. Rather, there are grounds for believing that the shareability of aesthetic pleasure plays a constitutive role in the experience of beauty itself. These experiences indicate that even the most seemingly intimate of sensations connects us to others, thus offering a somewhat comforting picture of the world whereby radical solipsism is in, averted in recognition of the fact that even subjective pleasures con contain traces of the other. In coming to this conclusion, however, we forewent further consideration of Proust's text. In particular, we ignored the suggestion that this pleasure became possible only after reconsidering an earlier view. While it is difficult to say for certain whether this recollection neatly references any one instance depicted in the work's 3,000 some pages, it probably refers to a brief and in many ways unmemorable passage in part two, chapter three of Sodom and Gomorrah. While visiting the church of Saint Jean, Saint Jean de la Haye, together with Albertine, the narrator informs us that, and this is the second passage that you have on your handout, The carriage could not take us all the way to the church. It's, I stopped it when we had passed through Quatre Homes and bade Albertine goodbye. For she alarmed me by saying of this church, as of other monuments and certain pictures, what a pleasure it would be to see it with you. This pleasure was one that I did not feel myself capable of giving her. I felt it myself in front of beautiful things only if I was alone or pretended to be alone and did not speak. But since she had hoped to be able to, to be able, thanks to me, to experience artistic sensations that cannot be communicated thus, I thought it more prudent to say that I must leave her. A bit of context is essential for understanding this passage, along with its possible connections to the scene in Venice. During the narrator's second stay at Balbec, his attentions have focused upon Albertine, the young woman who will develop into the central love of his life. Deleuze tells us that, quote, to fall in love is to individualize someone by the signs he bears or admits. And that while at Balbec, there's a slow individualization of Albertine in the group of young girls that Marcel becomes acquainted with. Accordingly, Marcel and Albertine continually find excuses to break away from the rest of the group, making regular day trips to the countryside. During what is arguably the height of their courtship, this strange separation occurs between these two lovers. And this is what's so strange about this passage, is that this is a moment in which um, Marcel is desperate to share everything with Albertine. We are told rather matter-of-factly that the narrator deemed himself incapable of sharing the pleasures of art with Albertine, and thus that it would be best to leave her. One might easily overlook this event, and for so many reasons as first-time readers of A la Recherche, we are encouraged to do so, were it not for the fact that the narrator's actions are so uncharacteristic of his otherwise arduous pursuit of Albertine. The narrator's admission that he was incapable of sharing in the pleasures of art with, her, with Albertine occurs at precisely the moment when he is desperate to share his world with her, as we so often are at the start of a new romance. 
As a suitor, Marcel is indulgent of Albertine's every whim, even though as a girl of humble origins, she refrains from making many demands upon him. In the larger scene to which this passage belongs, the narrator explains the length to which he goes in order to ensure Albertine's pleasures on these excursions, hiring a carriage to ensure that she enjoys a degree of comfort of which her want of money deprived her. More generally, one can see that Mar de Mar Marcel desperately longs to establish further intimacies with Albertine, and it is therefore perplexing that he would deny her this seemingly simple pleasure. Not only does the narrator resist Albertine's effort to create this intimacy through the shared pleasure of art, what Kant would have recognized as an empirical interest we have in the beautiful, he resists the very same Kantian thesis that he will later embrace, namely that a judgment regarding the shareability of a given sensation plays a constitutive role in the pleasures associated with the beautiful. As the narrator reports, in this instance, the feeling for beauty is solitary, an experience that often goes unannounced, most likely because it resists being shared, even with those closest to us. Is Marcel's inability to share these pleasures an intimation of waning affection for Albertine? Does it foreshadow the troubles that will plague their relationship? Or is it intended to allow readers to reflect upon the limits of love more generally? Regardless of how we may answer these questions, I'm primarily interested in what this passage tells us about the nature and place of beauty in the modern West. As philosophers, we are not yet sensitive enough to the transformations that take place beneath the seemingly smooth surface of our concepts. And as aestheticians, we are all too likely to project onto beauty the dispositions of a previous age. Far from being an element in a civic-minded culture more generally, the modern experience of the beautiful contains an inescapably solipsistic dimension, one that means that the contemplation of the beautiful thwarts complete communicability. This is the result of Kant having made the beautiful subjective, thus removing it from the world and of his having separated the aesthetic from the moral and cognitive considerations, thus making it difficult, if not impossible, to say much about such experiences. As every student of aesthetics knows, the specificity of the aesthetic is predicated upon its difference from the moral and the cognitive. This is basically what Kant means when he describes the judgment of taste as free, disinterested, and taking place independently of all concepts. As many thinkers since Kant have lamented, the very same arguments that granted the aesthetic a certain amount of autonomy from these other forms of evaluation also built into the aesthetic a certain amount of heterogeneity vis-a-vis -vis daily life. This is why we now understand art as an essentially disruptive and countercultural force. The form of experience it is said to sustain puts it at odds with pre-established moral, cognitive, and artistic codes. The constitutive feature of our modern experience was born the day that the aesthetic was placed in opposition to morality and cognition. And it is this root tension that has been so generative for art for the past 200 or so years. While some may want to claim that my account here exaggerates the separation of the aesthetic from other aspects of experience, and it is certainly the case that the aesthetic occupies a different position within other cultures, what needs to be recognized is that Historically speaking, it is this experience of heterogeneity that sustains the specifically modern idea that art is a force of social and political contestation. The paradox of aesthetics, as Jacques Ranciere has explained, is that art gains a political capacity on this understanding that it not be directly political. That is, on the condition that it eschew a, a type of communication operative in moral and political discourse. For Ranciere, the aesthetic experience functions as a political promise inasmuch as it points to something beyond the forms of domination built into everyday experience. What aesthetic experience annuls is the subordination of our sensuous faculties to our rational ones. And this is why Ranciere, following Schiller, can describe the aesthetic as a momentary suspension of the division of labor that exists within society and as the harbinger of political equality to come. The problem with this idea of aesthetics is that it refuses to acknowledge the radical and in some instances disquieting nature of the aesthetic experience. This is the result of the aesthetics having been set adrift, however briefly, from moral and cognitive concerns. In a sense, Ranciere's project is the effort to make sense of that which has been described as without sense. In this regard, his thought follows a long line of speculating about the promise of the aesthetic 
without attending to the undercurrents that sweep it away and set it up as only a castle in the sky. If we are to make headway in understanding not what the beautiful is, but what it is capable of, that is, what the effects of postulating the existence of an experience that cannot be identified by concepts, cannot be accounted for by rules or principles, and is only capable of being accessed by a subject divested of all interests, what we require is a framework expansive enough to follow the oscillations, torsions, and appropriations such an idea will likely undergo. As aestheticians, we have attended all too much to beauty's promissory structure. Here think of Stendhal's idea that beauty is the promise of happiness, Kant's argument that beauty is the symbol of morality, Schiller's idea that political progress will be achieved by fostering humankind's propensity for play, or Ranciere's recent suggestion that art can be understood as a form of sensible redistribution. We've done this without attending to that in art and our experience of it, which cuts against the grain of our best hopes. The beautiful can promise happiness or political emancipation, just as it can foreshadow our own obliteration. See Baudelaire, Wiesmann, and Lautremont. Because of its unique textual history, the beautiful comes to us today as an unstable phenomenon, one that sustains any number of different practical aspirations, artistic agendas, and subjective associations. For this reason, it is perhaps only right that so many artists and cultural critics have come to suspect that beauty is at best an unstable category, and at worst cover for irrationality, prejudice, and superstition. The Enlightenment's revenge upon itself. The aesthetic is essentially ungoverned and ungovernable, the result of its having been severed from cognition and morality. In this respect, the dominant features of our modern experience were no doubt established with the collapse of the classical problematic, wherein the beautiful was once associated with the one, the true, and the good. The practical result, as evidenced in Kant's text, is that art no longer needs to be associated with uplifting content, and the experience of the beautiful itself amounts to little more than a mute witnessing. In a culture dominated by capitalistic rationality, with its general suspicion regarding the gratuitous, such moments of useless sensation and idle thought will always be suspect. For philosophers, unlike the archaeologists of aesthetics, what proves intolerable is the idea of an experience unmoored from truth and falsity, and thus good and evil. And this is what the aesthetic gave to us, an idea of an experience that should not be subjected to the demands of truth and falsity or the expectations that it's either good or bad. While the passage announcing the narrator's inability to share in the pleasures of art and beauty with Albertine appears to be the antithesis of the Kantian view, it is my contention that it is better thought of as its undercurrent. Taken together, these seemingly opposed passages in Proust are not illustrations of the narrator's changing conception of beauty. They capture an essential oscillation at work in the experience of the beautiful itself. In this respect, the separation between Albertine and Marcel emblematizes the darker current issuing from the Kantian position, the one that places aesthetic reflection just prior to the return of shared sense. Opposing the cross current that makes taste a shared sense for what is pleasing, there is an undercurrent issuing from the separation upon which these pleasures are predicated. This dynamic, coupled with the nature of aesthetic reflection, makes the judgment of taste incapable of completely repairing the wound inflicted to define the aesthetic in its specificity. Since the universality of the judgment of taste was purchased by the removal of beauty from the world, there is the very real possibility that it will never be shared. Looking more closely at the Kantian position, one notes not that others really will share our sense for what is beautiful, only that they should. In fact, there are plenty of indications in Kant that such judgments will not be shared, despite the framework that justifies our searching for agreement. And here, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just skip this quote from Kant. But the idea is that uh, we have an expectation that these pleasures will be shared, um, or that they should be shared, but the expectation that they won't always be shared. There thus exists an immense gulf between what we are entitled to demand of others and what we actually expect from them. Unlike other objectively verifiable claims, the beautiful places us in the unusual position of demanding agreement while anticipating that our judgments will not be shared. It is only a slight exaggeration then to describe the beautiful as the source and locus of solitude in the Kantian universe. 
Whereas other judgments admit of objective verification, the beautiful throws us back upon ourselves, forcing us to admit that we are really and truly alone in coming to our judgments. It is perhaps this reason that the beautiful is so very poignant. It fosters in us a sense that our most intimate of feelings deserve to be shared while depriving us of any means of determining whether they really are. The beautiful sparks a longing for shareability while at the same time thwarting it. The beautiful thus creates a structure of human experience that we might call communicability without communication. In this regard, the famous solitude displayed in Allah Recherche would be the reverse side of any potential shared pleasures, aesthetic or otherwise. One such instance is the separation between Marcel and Albertine around the church of saint jean de la Haye. This separation mirrors the gulf that divides the subject making an aesthetic judgment from the hypothetical community to whom he or she addresses his pleasure. Simply put, this passage inherits from Kant the sense that the aesthetic exists as a solipsistic moment experienced outside of the normal parameters of experience, a solipsism stitched up but by no means healed by the judgment of taste. To what extent it is justifiable to read Albertine as a symbol and then as a symbol of the unknowability of others more generally is a question that would require a separate essay. It is nevertheless the ca case that the narrator expects readers to relate to Albertine in highly personal terms, as we saw above. By the time this passage occurs, there's already present the cycle of infatuation, suspicion, and jealousy that comes to define the narrator's relationship with her. From one page to the next, Marcel rejoices in his new love and then frets about, about her supposed bisexual tendencies. The ever-present specter of Albertine's bisexuality foregrounds her unknowability and perhaps the other's opacity more, general, more generally. In short, if one were to take Albertine as a symbol, she would be a reminder of the unfathomable otherness of the other, of the beloved other, and as a device for meditating upon the separation that exists between ourselves and others in even the most seemingly intimate of scenarios. If something of this picture is correct, then it is justifiable to read the scene with Albertine as Saint Jean de Laez as an attempt to confront readers with the unspoken and inescapable loneliness that creeps into every human relationship. This scene would be a way of imparting to readers an experience of what the narrator states openly at other points. And this, I will read this remarkable um, quote from Proust, which I call the most depressing thought. Proust says, or Marcel says, or Marcel Proust says, the bonds between ourselves and another person exist only in our minds. Memory as it grows fainter loosens them. And notwithstanding the illusion by which we want to be duped and with which we, out of love, friendship, politeness, deference, duty, we dupe other people, we exist alone. Man is the creature who cannot escape from himself, who knows other people only in himself, and when he asserts the contrary, he is lying. In certain moods, Marcel's philosophical idealism, idealism trips, tips over into an existential solipsism, one that reduces the other to the functioning of the ego. These scenes regarding the appreciation of art are unique, however, in that rather than advancing this viewpoint by means of what Robert Pippin describes as half-baked philosophical reasoning, Proust creates a compound image of solitude whose effective force is generated when readers synthesize the two scenes. <laughs> it is an image that haunts the entire book because it undermines our faith in the redemptive aspects of beauty including the beauty of the novel itself. The impression of Marcel's separation is all the more powerful because of the evidence that the narrator possesses the capacity for what he denies Albertine. It may seem as though my characterization of Albertine gives us cause for thinking that the beautiful is never fully shared because there's something about the other that resists being known. In fact, what I'm suggesting is the opposite. If we take Proust seriously, we have grounds for suspecting that the beautiful may be one way in which our solitude and the other's otherness come to be constituted. Part of what we taste in the aesthetic prior to the judgment that restores community is the poignancy of separation itself. When we apprehend the things, things aesthetically, we retreat from the world of shared meaning to entertain our own flights of imaginative and interpretive fantasy. 
We absent ourselves from both others and practical considerations on the expectation that we will rediscover them again on the other side of a reflective process that cannot be predicted at the outset, that is, cannot be reduced to the finality of a single concept. In this regard, the aesthetic experience is much more vertiginous than typically acknowledged. For in entering into it, we court the possibility of unintelligibility, an unintelligibility that may well alienate us from the rest of the human community permanently. This is why, despite its innocuous appearance, Nietzsche was able to seize upon the idea of disinterested contemplation and call it by its rightful name, intoxication. The much vaunted solitude of modern literature is one